If you had lived during the last days of Jesus' life, you would have experienced an event that would have sent shockwaves through the Jewish community. It wasn't his miracles. He had a lot of miracles that he performed, and that certainly got people's attention, but that's not what we're talking about. It wasn't necessarily the confrontation with the Pharisees, which a lot of people enjoyed that. They, they saw him put the Pharisees in their place many times, and you know that certainly got their attention because nobody did that without getting in trouble and having to answer for it. It wasn't necessarily his trial either because they had witnessed trials for years in the Roman environment. Uh, good people, bad people, you name it, they had witnessed plenty of trials. And people being accused of being guilty when they weren't. Uh, that wasn't you know, something new to them. And it wasn't even necessarily the crucifixion. They had witnessed crucifixions for years. It wasn't pleasant. It was painful. It was excruciating. It was drawn out over a long period of time, but they had experienced it. They had seen it. And so the crucifixion wasn't something that they were necessarily shocked by. The priests were in shock at this time. The people were in shock, but didn't understand what was taking place and what had happened. The priests didn't understand what had happened. And even the Romans knew that this event was significant. Even as pagan as they were, and as many gods as they had, they knew that what was taking place was something completely different and had some significance to it. That event is found over in Matthew chapter 27. If you'll turn over there. I wanted to start with a little different take on it today than what we normally do with atonement. It doesn't change the meaning of it at all. It just adds to it, but it, it's something a little bit different but something you're very familiar with. Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 45, it was about the sixth hour and darkness was over all the land under the ninth hour. And the Bible and some of the commentaries point out that when something like this occurred, especially going back to the book of Amos, that this was a period of judgment. This was a period of something important taking place. Jesus was hanging on the cross. He was just about to give his last breath and to die. And he said at the last minute, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In verse 46. And they ran to try to give him some help with a sponge soaked with vinegar. And in verse 50 it said, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. This got people's attention. They had no idea what was taking place. They didn't expect this. You can imagine their mouths dropping open after they had witnessed something like this. And yet, here's our Savior hanging on the cross who has just died. And this is the reason that it was split in two. We're going to understand some about this today. We're going to under, look into it and see exactly what all of this had to do and to mean with the Day of Atonement. The, the thing is that no one understood what was taking place at the time and the depth of what was happening because the life of mankind was going to be changed forever, for the better. They didn't understand that. This event was the atonement for mankind, yet it was overlooked back then as it is still, for the most part, overlooked today. If you tell somebody that uh, you know, you're keeping atonement, it's in the community, uh, their mouths may drop open because they think, wow, all day and all night with nothing to eat and drink, how do you, how do you survive? It really isn't that difficult. You may be a little uncomfortable towards the end of the day, but, but you can survive. And I, I found out something this week, a couple of days ago, I didn't know took place. For those of you that don't know, my wife works for a Jewish company, and the owner was telling her that uh, when they spend the afternoon at the synagogue over here, or the temple, um, they send somebody outside close to sunset to stand and watch for the first star. They don't eat till they see the first star. And I had never heard that. So ours is just till sunset. They have to wait till they see the first star, I guess. But, but it's overlooked today. Most people, you know, don't acknowledge it. Now, Fox News this morning had a, had a real nice few-minute segment on it coming on the news and 
wishing everybody a happy Yom Kippur, hoping that they have, you know, a, um, it wasn't a safe Yom Kippur, what they say, it was an easy Yom Kippur, so that it wasn't going to be too rough on you. But they at least acknowledge it. But what was it that mankind needed to be saved? Was there anything man could do? Well, they tried keeping the law perfectly. The Pharisees were a good example of that, and they were pretty good at it. How'd that turn out? Well, it, it really didn't work, did it? Because Jesus condemned them, and Jesus pointed that out to them. That in spite of all their efforts, they were falling short of what needed to be done. What about the sacrifices and the services back in the Old Testament? Carried over somewhat to the New Testament for a period of time, but the Old Testament, uh, we're going to talk about that. Those services were very involved, very time consuming, and they were tough. They really were. Didn't really solve the problem, now did it? What about after the death of Christ? What about having faith and receiving the Holy Spirit and being repentant? Well, that was a start on the right road which you and I are continuing on, but we've got a ways to go. Well, the main point I want to make with you today, and I want you to remember through the whole sermon, you can write this down if you want, is I want you to realize the completeness of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and how that that is all that's needed because that's what we're going to be talking about. You know, you would think that people would understand how important this day is and not just this day, but a lot of God's days. If you go back to the book of Leviticus and you look at verse 1 and 2 and a couple other verses, it talks about the feasts of the Lord. These are the feasts. These are God's feasts. This is what God wants us to do and expects us to do. And he described in Leviticus 23 all the things that we're going to be doing throughout the year and keeping his holy days. The, Amer the New American Standard Bible refers to them as appointed times, which is a little more specific, a little more degree of understanding what they really are. I came across about a year and a half ago a really good Hebrew dictionary, and I started looking up some of these things, and some of the Hebrew words, you don't just get a brief two or three word statement about what it means. Some of these words, you get almost a whole column of what this word meant, how it was used in the Old Testament, New Testament, very involved, and I was very impressed with it. But it referred to a word, the appointed times, the feast, as moed, which is a specific time, and it's a place for God's people to meet with him. That's why you and I are here. It went on to say that it was a time where we were to focus on our relationship with him, and the temple and the synagogue came in specific view with this particular word. And the people were required to participate, which is what we do. You know, that word takes on a whole new meaning when, when you read over it and it says, these are the feasts of the Lord, these are the appointed times of the Lord. When you read that and understand that explanation of it, and it had quite a bit more with it, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to you know, get into that, but when you, when you hear that and, and how the, this is important for us to be here at a specific time, it really means something to you and to me. Because it's a time where we are to focus on our relationship with him. Whether it was in the temple or whether it was in the synagogue. You know, business meetings are important. And you wonder why people, people don't become more involved with business meetings with God, with their creator. You know, why would you want to miss this? Why would you not be here? Well, yeah, this particular day is not very, you know, popular because of not eating and drinking. People just cannot understand that. But yet the Holy Days explain, you know, God's plan for mankind. It links everything together with why we are here and what is happening. And, and then for one thing, it's why the world is so confused because they've, they've forgotten about a lot of this and what it points to. What was it that mankind needed to be saved? I don't think a lot of people really understand that. I think people have embraced Christ. I think people have embraced that he exists but they don't carry their lives any further and they're just in essence believing with nothing else linked to it. And I don't know how many people I've run into just this last year 
who believe in God and who believe in Christ and are very, very ignorant when it comes to God's Word or anything about what's taking place in the Bible. It's never picked up and read. They're never involved with it. And yet, these particular times are times where we come together and we understand who God is, what He's doing, and what He expects of us. If you would, turn over to Romans chapter 3. This begins to explain exactly what has happened and where we are and why we need this day. And we're going to, as we go through this sermon, we're going to see the completeness of the sacrifice of Christ, like I said, but we're also going to understand his ministry and what his ministry was involved in doing and accomplishing this atonement for you and for me. And it applies to all of us. It applies to all of mankind. But I think one of the things you're going to see you know, through all of this is what the saved and the unsaved are like and the difference between the two. Because as you go through this, as you go through the Old Testament, as you go through the New Testament, you begin to see that God is concerned with those who are saved. He wants the unsaved to become saved, to turn to him. But for the most part, he's dealing with us to make sure that we are continuing on that road and learning the lessons that we need to in life. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, Paul says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's why there was a veil in the temple. That's why Adam and Eve were separated from God from the Garden of Eden. That's why you and I are separated except for the life of Christ because we're separated from his glory. That's what sin did. It, it removed God from us because of our sin. And when you look at that, that veil that was there, God only came into the temple once a year on the Day of Atonement. He only came there at that particular time because that was the meeting place with mankind once a year. And with that veil taken away with Christ and his sacrifice having done away with all of that, Christ has become the meeting place with God for man. I don't think we understand what it must have been like to have been in Old Testament times in the desert on the Day of Atonement. It would have been a whole lot different than it is for us. You know, they had a service to perform and go through. They didn't have the air conditioning that we have, the, the you know, comfortable environment to sit here. And I'm sure it was a very tough Day of Atonement for them. But that was because of the sin of Adam and Eve. That's what sin did. It separated God from mankind. There was no access. All those years until Christ came, there was no access to God. And it wasn't until Christ came and died that we actually have access to God the Father. I don't know if, if we can comprehend that or not. We get down and ask God for help. We have a relationship with him in our prayers. They were, it was foreign to them. They didn't have that. They had to go through the priests. And it was only on that one time of year where God actually had a relationship and a meeting place with man. And all of the services that were required and, and had to be performed on that particular day. And if, you know, as you know as well as I do, sacrificing isn't pleasant. Killing an animal is not pleasant. It's noticeable. It really is. And to think of everything that had to be you know, done in that service, and it had to be performed precisely, perfectly, exactly what God wanted. Being justified, in verse 24 he says, freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. That word propitiation was a, was a word that you and I don't understand that much because we're not around it, we don't hear it very often, but this word was originally a word that was very common used in pagan worship, and it was a word that was meant to uh, use to appease the gods. And that's what Paul was trying to get across to them. It was the only way to gain God's favor was the death of Jesus Christ. The only way. How many times have you heard that we can do nothing on this day? Well, 
Mankind can do nothing. It had to be through Christ. It was only by him. It was only by him coming down to this earth and doing what he did so that mankind could be justified, so that mankind could be reconciled to God, so that there could be a meeting place with God and man. And that relationship that was destroyed back in the beginning could be rectified and changed. I don't think a lot of us realize what it must have been like back in the Garden of Eden. Uh, we read about it, we get very little from the book of Genesis about it, but can you imagine a relationship with God, the Creator, talking with you, dwelling with you day in and day out as, as, as one who is helping you to come to understand His creation? Hard to understand that. And yet, all it took was one sin and it was all gone. The whole course of human history was changed. You know, I heard a phrase this past week, and I forgot to write down, you may remember where this came from, but the man that said it, um, it goes back in history a little ways, evil grows when the good do nothing. And so Christ had to come down and to rectify that evil. Christ had to come down and change things so that there was something that was going to be salvageable with God's creation. You know, it didn't take very long after the the Adam's sin and the ex expulsion from the Garden of Eden, it wasn't, wasn't that long of a period of time until God brought the flood. And, you know, when we read in Genesis how that man's heart was only set on evil all the time, it, it's hard to imagine things being worse back then than they are now. Now, granted, we still live in some fairly good times with a lot of evil that's out there, but when God destroys the whole world because evil is so bad, it doesn't take long for evil to grow, and it certainly didn't. <clears throat> over in Romans chapter 8, a few more pages over, this changing of what has occurred, this, this atonement, this dying for mankind, this forgiving mankind of their sins and removing those sins is something that has taken place, but as Paul pointed out, this, this, this verse here has always fascinated me. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Because there is more to come. There's far more that's going to be available. What, what has happened was just on the surface. And a lot of people, a lot of people that you know that believe in God and believe in Christ don't understand the full depth of it, of what has taken place. But this world is waiting for a change. This world needs a change. Not what they want it to change to, but what it's going to change to. And it's going to be for their benefit. It's going to be for, I, I think, the majority of mankind will repent and turn to God and, and accept that sacrifice of Christ and come to understand what you and I understand. And so we go about our lives on this day, as well as the other holy days, living them, having a relationship with God, dwelling with Him here during services today and in the next few weeks, and we have that relationship with him that was made possible by Christ that the majority of the world does not understand and have. And when you miss these appointed times, you really miss something with your creator. It's hard to imagine that, but people do that. A few weeks ago, I gave a sermon, and I mentioned four Hebrew words for sin. I'd like to mention those again because I think it describes the state of what Jesus had to do to correct what had happened with mankind because that sin drove a wedge and removed us from God's presence. The first one, I'm not going to spell them out or pronounce them to you. They're Hebrew. They're not going to mean a whole lot to you. But the first one has to do with the idea of missing the mark or deviating from the goal, which is exactly what took place in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, that, that's what happened. Then you have another Hebrew word which mentions the action in a breach of a relationship, rebellion, or revolution. That's something far greater, far deeper than what took place in the, in the Garden of Eden. I mean, there was rebellion because Adam and Eve did what they do, did. But this tends to be, and it tend to be and, and appear to be more spiritual. The third one is a deliberate perversion or twisting. And we know who is guilty of that. We've seen that. We saw that in the book of Genesis 
with Satan and what he was doing. And the final word was the idea of straying away from the correct path, which is what we are encouraged to do each day. Stick with the path that we're on. Stay with it. Continue in this no matter what. Even in a time when Christianity is coming under assault in the country in which we live. It's hard to believe. Who would have thought that this would have happened in just a year in our own country? But it's happened. The problem was that, that sin had to be corrected. It had to be wiped out. It had to, be, had, had to have something done that was going to be effective and be permanent. And when you look back on it, there was nothing else that could have been done to wipe it out and would be permanent. A couple of words for atonement. One of the Hebrew words, kapar, is, is to cover, to forgive, to reconcile. And this dictionary pointed out it was imposing of something to change its appearance or nature. It communicates God's covering of sin with righteousness. The other one is kapurium, which means atonement, act of reconciliation, or the day of atonement. So there was something that had to change its nature. Sin's nature had to be changed. The effects of sin had to be changed. You know, what, is it, what does it say in the New Testament? The soul that sins, it shall die. And that's exactly what you and I face. However, because of what Christ did, that death that we may experience is not going to be permanent. That there, that's just the end of this particular life, but there is so much more available to us because of what Christ has done. You know, we are, we are forgiven by his death, his sacrifice for sin, but we are saved by his life. In that, the future, what lies beyond, is so much more important in the life we live today. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Did you ever think about what we stand to inherit? I think what we read in Scripture is just the tip of the iceberg. I think if you could picture, people like to picture Destin, Florida with all the sand on the beach. If you could picture that in your mind today, what we understand about God's kingdom, what God has in heaven, it's about a handful of sand compared to the rest of the sand on the beach. I think that's all we get. You know, the Bible says the secret things belong to God. He certainly kept a lot of them secret. And he just gives us a little bit to kind of whet our appetite as to what lies out there. I don't think we understand that. and We're partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness, with death, you know, with no hope, no future, he's delivered us from that and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. You know, a tremendous understanding that you and I have, even though it's just a little bit, but yet it was made possible because of the love of God and because of the love of Christ and God giving his son to come down here and, and go through what he did for each of us. Christ has rescued us from the darkness that we faced where there was no other way that it could have happened. Verse 20, he says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in heaven or things in earth, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. That's all of us. It applies to each of us. Yet now has he reconciled. He's made peace between God and us by his life and by what he has done when he was dead and resurrected. I think that, that alone is a whole topic in itself in trying to understand and comprehend what has taken place. I'm thankful for that. I don't know about you. Um, you know, we go through this every year and we take this time to repent and think about our lives and, 
and make sure that we stay on that right track. We have that goal in mind that we're focused on where we're supposed to be going and not steadily falling backwards. Um, you know, hopefully we are, are the lives that we live, the graph that you project out there looks a lot better than the economic graph or some of the other graphs they put on TV. Hopefully it's always something headed upwards towards being like the focal point, Christ, which who led the perfect life, which was who all of us are trying to live by. I want to read a couple statements from C.S. Lewis's book on mere Christianity, on what he had to say about some of these things. It was really interesting because when you get to the end of it, he talks about atonement of all things. Never would have thought that. He said in, in his book, Mere Christianity, chapter 4, The Perfect Penitent, he talks about his life before he was a Christian and some of the things that he didn't understand and what he came to see. He said, we are faced then with a frightening alternative. This man we are talking about either was and is just what he said or else he was a lunatic or something else. I have to accept the view that he was and is God. God has landed on this enemy-occupied world in human form. And it is and it was an enemy-occupied world. He said, before I became a Christian, I was under certain thoughts about different things. He said, Christ volunteered to be punished instead, and so God let us off. What I came to see later on was that neither this theory nor any other is Christianity. The central Christian belief is that Christ's death has somehow put us right with God and given us a fresh start. I think that's the one thing that we can, we can really grasp on in, in this particular Day of Atonement is how that we have a fresh start with God and with the life that we live. And we don't have, as we're going to see, we don't have to worry about something that we have done. We can repent and change and move forward and we still have hope. And that's one of the things about atonement that when you talk to people that think that you're going to be doing without food and water for a day, they don't look at it as being a day of hope. But uh, we look at it as a day of hope because we know what it means and where it's headed and what it shows us. He said, we are told that Christ was killed for us and that his death has washed out our sins and that by dying, he disabled death itself. That is the formula. That is Christianity. That is what has to be believed. He goes on to say, this process, and in, in talking about repentance, this process of surrender is movement full speed astern, is what Christians call repentance. Repentance is no fun at all. It isn't, is it? Not fun. It is something much harder than merely eating humble pie. It means unlearning all the self-conceit and self-will that we have been training ourselves into for thousands of years. It means killing part of yourself and undergoing a kind of death. And boy, do we try to do that throughout the year, constantly trying to change something so that we don't wind up dying because of what we've done permanently without any hope. But unfortunately, we now need God's help in order to do something which God in his own nature never does at all, to surrender, to suffer, to submit, to die. Nothing in God's nature corresponds to this process at all. So that on the, on the one road for which we now need God's leadership most of all is a road God in his own nature has never walked. God can only share what he has. This thing in his own nature he is not. But supposing God became man. We cannot share God's dying unless God dies, and he cannot die except by being a man. That is the sense in which he pays our debt and suffers for us for what he himself need not suffer at all. So to what will you look for help if you will not look to that which is stronger than yourself? And so we look to Christ. Such is my own way of looking at what Christians call the atonement. I thought that was interesting for him to bring that out. A person who one time in his life didn't really believe in God and Christ. But you see there is meaning in this day of atonement. It, it, it does transfer to all people, not just you and me. But they don't have the opportunity to understand that. I think one of the things that you find at the beginning of the book of John in the New Testament is what John the Baptist said about Christ that was so overlooked by all those people around him when he said it. 
as Christ was walking down to be baptized, John said, Behold the Lamb of God. And I don't think anybody around understood what was taking place and what was happening. And so often Jesus was very reserved, you know, very quiet, didn't say a lot. He, he, he said some things, but in, you know, he didn't correct John and say he was not the Lamb of God. But you can picture what might have happened and how it must have been for him to go through that and to, and to reach that point. Over in Philippians chapter 2, I think one of the things that we need to, to look at is how important this scripture is to each of us. I think it's hard for us to grasp. He says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7, but he made himself no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You know, not only was Jesus humble, but he was also obedient. And I think that's something that transfers to us. When we look at his ministry and what he did, he was obedient. And he's presented to us an example of how we should live our lives, not only being humble, but also being obedient to God and what God expected and wants us to do. It goes back to what I've said several times in regards to what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said about costly grace. Boy, grace was costly. It was not easy. It was painful, and it cost, as you well know, the death of, of God's Son, you know, and what he went through. You know, try to picture, if you can, and just picture what it was like, where Jesus was, where he came from, what he went through, and what he did for you and for me. You know, we can't even picture what it was like in heaven when he was beside God in all of his power and to come down and take up on the form of us, which is not pleasant sometimes, especially as you get older. You'll experience that, all you younger ones. Uh, you'll know what that's like. Aging is, is maturing, but it's also got its, it's got its unpleasant side. But to come where he came from and then to come down and to experience the pain, the suffering, and most trying probably the depths of temptation, the, the depths of temptation that he went through that we will never experience because the times that we are tempted in the depths of temptation, we give in. We sin. But Jesus never sinned. Jesus never gave in. How deep do you think those depths of temptation were to him by Satan? You know, not just his feelings and emotions. He was bombarded day in and day out. I... I believe this by Satan and his demons throughout his life because they had one goal in mind to cause him to sin which would have wrecked reconciliation which would have wrecked God's creation which would have destroyed the coming of God's kingdom and God dwelling with mankind which was original which was the original tent back in the garden of Eden poor man if he would have just taken that tree of life we would have never had to gone through this. That's a big topic in itself. But if Adam and Eve had taken to the tree of the life, God could have dwelled with man, mankind could have reproduced, there would have been no sin, there would have been no you know, separation from God's glory. But that's history, that's in the past. And when you imagine what goes on within the world around us, this evil world, it took 21 days for Michael to help in Daniel chapter 10 to reveal what Daniel wanted to understand and know. 21 days to get the message to Daniel. And you think Christ wasn't hounded day in and day out by demons, by Satan himself. You know, that scenario in Matthew chapter 4, I think it was, about when he was fasting and Satan came to him, there was a whole lot more went on there than just that. That's just an idea of what he faced. Hebrews chapter 9. Let's go in to the ministry of Christ and look at it and see what that's like. Because this is where it's all at. I, I love this chapter around atonement and what, what it all means for each of us. Hebrews chapter 9. 
Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary, for there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, the second veil and the tabernacle, and verse 3, the holiest, holiest of all. You had all these things that were in the holiest of all, verses 4 and 5, and how important that was, which had to do with the first covenant, which had to do with what the priest had to do. But it said in verse 7, into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Spirit, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. They didn't have that access to the Father that you and I have access to. That, would, that alone would have changed our lives with the lack of contact with God and the lack of being able to be with Him. You know, one of the things that you, you understand with the specifics about what was involved back then was so involved it was, it was almost as if you would lose the meaning of the day because you were so conscious of trying to do things properly. Yet that was part of what had to be done. And all of this pointed to Christ in his sacrifice and in his life and how he lived and what he was doing. And if you can understand, if you can read the, you know, back in Leviticus 16 about some of this and, and the service that was expected of the high priest to do on the Day of Atonement, you begin to understand what the ministry of Christ was like and what it all involved. Because the Hebrew Levitical system was always looking for blood. And that blood that it was always looking for in the sacrifices never performed and did what the blood of Christ does. It was always temporary. It was always something that had to be repeated. And as we'll see, never did take away the sins of the people. He says in verse 9, this was a figure for them, for them for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. You know, they, and if you look over in Hebrews chapter 10, which is just across the page in my Bible, um, it says in verse 3, in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Their consciences could not be cleaned because they remembered these things year in and year out. You and I have that opportunity to have our sins forgiven and removed as far as the east is from the west and we don't have to have any more thoughts about them. If we've repented and changed and overcome them, they're gone. We don't have to worry about that. But the service in the Old Testament, these people were constantly reminded every year of what was happening. Verse 11, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come, and this is the part that deals with his ministry today, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in into the once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us by his one sacrifice, one time only. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now that we know that it was complete, that it was perfect, that it was totally cleansing, we don't have to have that as a weight upon our minds. It can be removed. Don't you imagine the people in the Old Testament dreaded the Day of Atonement? where they could do nothing, they could add nothing, they could contribute nothing, and the high priest is the one that did all the work there in the Holy of Holies. It was a long, drawn-out day for them, I guarantee you. And yet, they don't have the blessings that we have today because of the ministry of Christ. Verse 15, and for this cause, he is the mediator of a New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgression that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Yeah, we have an eternal inheritance, a future that is very bright. Hope. This day is filled with hope as to what lies beyond for you and for me. 
For where, verse 16, a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator lives. He goes on to say that, in verse 23, that it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. You know, where atonement really matters, in other words, is in heaven before God. And this is what Christ did. He presented himself before God with his sacrifice, with what he had done, one time with complete forgiveness, which allows us to have that relationship with God that we have today because of this one man. He says in verse 24, For Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are of the figures of the true, not into the tabernacle or to the temple in the Holy of Holies, but he says into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, for you and for me. That's encouraging. That's filled with hope. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others, for then he must have all suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So much more complete, so much more fulfilling, so much more lasting than anything the priesthood could have done. And he said, as it appointed unto men once to die after this, the judgment. And I think when we think of atonement and when we think of our dying and judgment facing us, that is when atonement finally does appear. Because when we're judged, if we've been forgiven and atoned for, you're not convicted. You're not held guilty. You're innocent. And if you're innocent, what happens then? Well, we read in verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin, to salvation and that's what you and I have the chance for because of what he did salvation he'll appear the second time as it says without sin why because sin has been atoned for it's been removed and you can stand before God being judged and be innocent so much is missed by people who are not part of this and don't understand what this is. I don't know if you know this or not, but back on August the 1st of this year, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal, journal says an ancient tomb meets a modern horror. And the Jews on the Day of Atonement, just for your information, their last book that they read through is the book of Jonah. Well, the tomb of Jonah was destroyed in August, or at the end of July, in the ancient city of Nineveh, which is today Mosul. And it mainly went unnoticed, but it was destroyed by the Islamic extremists. And they made a note of that in the Wall Street Journal about Jonah and his book. You know, Jonah was the only prophet that was ever sent to the Gentiles. He was sent to a group of rough people, if you will. People he didn't want to have to go to. But the Jewish tradition requires a recitation of the four chapters of Jonah, which serve as the concluding biblical message of the day and are read in every synagogue around the world. To understand this reason, the, Talmud, the Talmudic, Talmudic rabbis felt that the book of Jonah captures the quintessential, quintessential message from Yom Kippur because it is a story that reminds us that God judges the whole world. And the people that don't keep atonement are going to have to realize they're still going to be judged by God too, even though they may not want to be a part of this. No one can flee from God. No one can hide from God. You know, there are going to be consequences for people who are guilty. And you and I don't have to worry about those consequences, do we? Because our Savior has paid the price for each of us. And one of the things it points out about the book of Jonah is that no matter how bad somebody is, no matter how bad a group of people are, or a nation of people, or what they have done, or what they have committed, repentance is still possible. And that's 
what you and I understand. They don't understand that, but they will have that opportunity. They will be given a chance to repent and to change and to be a recipient of what you and I understand and are going to be receiving in the inheritance later on. Well, that, that's what the ministry of Christ has to do. It says in verse 3 of, of chapter 10, again, these sacrifices or remembrance made every year was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. But verse 12, that this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And that's where he is today. For by one offering, verse 14, he has perfected forever them that are set apart. You and I are set apart. We're no, no more special than anybody out there in the world, but we've been given an opportunity to understand something. We've been given a chance now to be some of those first fruits, if you will, and be called and chosen with a specific opportunity to be a part and maybe sometime in the future to explain some of this to some of your friends and family and neighbors on the Day of Atonement in the future, whatever. We don't know what will happen, but we know what has happened and how wonderful that is and what is available to us. In conclusion, if you would, turn over to Romans chapter 5, verse 10. <clears throat> It says, for if when we, were when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. You know, our sins have been covered. Our sins have been eliminated. Our sins have been forgiven forever. We don't have to worry about them any longer as long as we are willing to continue walking in the path that we're on and focus on the goal that lies ahead. Well, what was it that mankind needed to be saved? Well, the sacrifices didn't work. They, needed to, they really needed a perfect sacrifice with no blemishes. They needed a perfect sacrifice with spilled blood. And they need one that was sincere and was perfect. But the only thing that could have been done was the life of Christ, that you and I have that opportunity to understand and have that relationship developed once again with God, the creator of heaven, the creator of earth, you know, the father of Jesus Christ. We have that opportunity to be a part and have a relationship with him as we come together on these days, which are appointed times. There are business meetings, if you will, with, with your God and your Creator. And they're necessary for us to have that relationship. And we can have that relationship so special because the veil that was removed allows us to have that one-on-one, -on -one, if you will, with God. Of all the things that's hard to grasp is the God, the Creator of Heaven, the Father and the Son, having a relationship with you and with me, one-on-one. -on -one. Because... We do nothing, we contribute nothing, and we can add nothing. We just have to watch, observe, and to think about today what Jesus Christ did in his ministry for each of us. Because Christ is all that matters. And we need to remember to always look to him.